over the past 20, 30 years, whereas there's an abundance of dentists. There's too many dentists. Uh, we're talking about over 200,000 dentists just in Brazil, uh, over 20,000 young dentists graduating each year. So it's, it's a lot of us out there. And we, we as dentists, we're not trained to be uh, business people. Of course, we have to learn how to be agents of health, but uh, we, we don't necessarily, uh, are, we're not necessarily trained on how to be business people. Okay, so um, marketing is very important. And, and I always like to tie the conversation about marketing when I'm talking about tooth whitening because it, it's a great opportunity. It's a treatment that, long story short, it, it can give your patients impactful results at a low cost and with minimal invasiveness. So it's a very cons conservative treatment. So um, and if we have to, if we are to talk about tooth whitening, we have to understand um, some psychological factors, and, and particularly the standards of beauty, okay? So, of course, you know uh, that the standards of beauty are constantly changing. Uh, things that were ugly back in the day are pretty now. And, and, of course, some things that were acceptable back in the day are no longer acceptable these days. And in dentistry, since the year 1990, when tooth whitening came about with the current techniques, and then after that, shortly after that, we had layering composite stratification techniques. We have amazingly beautiful uh, ceramic restorations available as well. Uh, now we have uh, aligner uh, orthodontic treatments that are very easy and accessible. So, um, of course, these standards, as dentistry becomes more available, they become, they, 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 people start taking more advantage of this. And um, the concept of white teeth is usually associated with a healthy appearance, with a healthy smile. And um, if you go even, you know, if you go uh, in history, thousands of years ago, if you, if you go back to the Bible, to the Holy Bible, you will see mentions there about this young man, strong, very strong, and with teeth white as milk, meaning that this, this guy was really healthy. Uh, he was a symbol of, you know, a healthy person, a, a good-looking guy. And it's interesting to, to, to see that socially still today a white tooth, a white smile is still associated with a healthy smile, even though it is no longer, it is not necessarily the truth. You can have healthy smiles that are a yellowish and vice versa. You can have white smiles that are not necessarily healthy. Okay? All right. So um, if we look at some of all of the celebrities that were protagonists in most movies back in the day, back in the you know, early 90s. Uh, you can see three of them here within music, within movies, uh, some of them still active. And, and you can see those were their smiles at their peak of their careers back in the day. And uh, if you had a, a gummy smile, if you have a yellowish smile, if you have misaligned teeth, that was okay. Uh, but today, this, uh, in some industries, of course, in Hollywood, Bollywood, um, in entertainment, uh, it is not necessarily, the impact is, is much more immediate and strong. But really, at any profession, uh, if you're going through a job interview or social life dating, of course, uh, if, you are no, no, if you're not in sync with those standards of beauty, people may perceive uh, someone with a smile that's not in harmony. Okay, and again, my uh, point here today is not to, to, tell, to get people to pursue a perfect smile, okay? I don't believe in perfect smiles, but uh, we have to think about harmonious smiles and educate our patients about it. Even if we look at these um, actors and musicians here, uh, we have Tom Cruise, we have, you know, of course, Nicolas Cage, uh, and uh, you see that they aged but their teeth have gotten younger, okay? So uh, dentistry today is allowing that, is allowing people to have more beautiful smiles. So it, it's exciting. It is very exciting to be involved, to be a part of this. And of course, we have to tell our patients because some of these treatments, even for instance, tooth whitening, depending on the country that you're watching this from, uh, it may be allowed for, uh, you know, people to open a shop, a shopping mall, 
and, and, and start doing tooth whitening on people like in the United States, even here in Australia, in Australia, it, it's, 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 it's fairly open uh, for people can get whitening products anywhere. And uh, it is important for us to explain to our patients the, the risks, the benefits, uh, all the implications around tooth whitening. Okay, so let me, uh, still talking about that uh, harmony in smile. Uh, the single most relevant factor, considering a smile to be within harmony or out of harmony, is the color of teeth. Uh, one dark tooth is the one single aspect that comes to shine, that comes up, that it's perceivable the most in a smile. So, um, I don't know if you've seen, uh, there, there's some, I, I should have brought uh, those images and shown here uh, from Colgate, that they have some adverts with, you know, a couple, and uh, there's something on someone's tooth there, and, but the guy doesn't have an eyebrow, or, or he has two hand, three hands or six fingers in a hand, and the only thing we can notice is actually the thing on the tooth. Uh, and, and that's natural. It's something that's not in harmony with someone's teeth it's, it's immediately perceived. So we have to understand that even more for us clinicians, for us dentists, uh, dental professionals, because we, that's, that's our jobs, right? But uh, it really does come to face more quickly than other things that may be out of harmony. And uh, speaking of tooth whitening, there's one tip that I can, can give you as well as you're addressing with your patients. Well, first of all, bring it up to your patients. Uh, as you are seeing your patient for the first time and you, you are asking them, why are they here to see you? Uh, ask them, are you happy with the color of your smile? Uh, have you ever thought about uh, doing a tooth whitening treatment? Ask them because then they will know that it, this is your area. This is not for some Kardashian uh, sister on Instagram to sell a product to them. Okay, so make sure you own this as a dental professional. And also, uh, if you're looking for harmony, uh, the reference for uh, white smiles, for the color of the smile, is the color, the white of the eye. So if you look at someone's face, uh, you, you have this natural tendency of comparing the white of teeth, which turned really not white, right, with the white of the eye. If they are, if those two colors don't match very well, then you may see, you, you will feel that someone's smile is, is, is out of harmony. Or sometimes even too white if someone overdoes it, okay? So um, this is something that you can uh, address and talk to your patients about. Now, I will challenge you with your question. Speaking of your patients, I want you to think about your patients and uh, imagine that if they know everything there is to know about tooth whitening, they know it's it's a safe treatment. They know there's no harm uh, to enamel if you do it right, if you do it with the right products. Uh, it's, so it's minimally invasive. There is low risk for them, except for maybe some sensitivity that some people can have during a treatment. There's always a chance for that to happen. And they had the means, they could pay for it, okay? How many of your patients do you think would want to have their teeth whitened, okay? So I'm actually launching a poll for you there. Uh, if you're from, from your computers or from your phones, uh, you may see a question there. I want you to vote. Uh, is it all your patients that would want to whiten their teeth? Is it most of them? Is it about half of them? Is it just a few of them? Is it none of them? Okay, so please vote. This is the first question is how many of your patients would want to whiten? The second question that is already available to you as well, how many of your patients have actually had their teeth whitened, okay? So see if there's a difference between what, what is logical, what you think they would want, and what is really happening at your practice, okay? So thank you for participating. Thank you for voting there. And I, I'm starting to see here some results as well. I see that 45%, I'll let you I'll just give you a few more seconds here to vote. Uh, question number one and question number two. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Let's close this and I'll show you. Uh, share results. There we go. So uh, you see here, you voted that most of your patients uh, would want to have their teeth whitened. Between most and all of them, more than half of you voted that 
between all of your patients and most of your patients? And this is usually the answer I get, okay? Uh, only one person voted none of them, okay? Out of 100, uh, all 200 people almost. Uh, and now the second question, how many of your patients actually have whitened their teeth? And uh, most of you, uh, over two thirds said of just a few of them, okay? So uh, this is exactly what I was expecting for, for this question here. So thank you for, for your participation. Um, so this is our reality. Where is that gap between what should they want and why they not done it? When I ask that, a lot of people tell me, well, they don't have the money to pay for it. Okay, that makes sense. Let's talk about this a little bit. And, and this has been very interesting to see during COVID times, during the pandemic, because um, we, we've seen in some countries, particularly here in Australia, sure, here it, it's, a, it's a developed country. Uh, people have, you know, the more resources. And, but what we've seen here, and I've seen that in other countries as well, is uh, that now that people are not traveling, their expenditure on dental treatments has increased. Okay? And this may have happened in your regions as well. This has been very interesting to see that we, we bumped up in the priority one step or a few steps over things that people are not able to do anymore. Uh, we have video conferences now all the time. So maybe people are looking at themselves more at, at, the, at this mirror, at, at this camera. So maybe they want to address something that they may have not noticed before. Um, but let's talk about who are we competing against. We're not competing against dentists across the street. We're not competing against, you know, each other. Mostly, we are competing against other priorities in our patients' minds. So um, let's, I, I don't know what's the spread here between your participants. We have 400 people here at the moment. Uh, I don't know if most of you are female or male. I usually ask this to female, but again, there's no... Uh, no, no reason why not ask both groups, but how much, think about yourselves now, okay? How much do you spend on your hair, okay? And, and I'm sure we'll get all sorts, I'm not going to make a poll out of this, but just think it for yourselves. I'm, I'm sure we're going to get a wide range of answers from very little to, to quite a bit. And uh, think about your patients, right? How much are your patients spending on their hairs? So how much do they spend each time they go to the hair salon? Okay, think about that. Um, how many times do they do it in a year? Is it 12 times? Is it more than, is it once a month, more or less? Okay, so try to have that equation in your mind. The single visit cost, multiple the times they do that in a year, and think about how long does it last once they go to the hairdresser? How long does it last that effect of that haircut or of, of, their, of, of that styling that they do, okay? So think about tooth whitening. Um, how much are you charging? How much would they pay for a tooth whitening treatment? And how long would that last? Uh, usually we talk about between six months to two years is a good average, you know? So one year easily you can have the effects of whitening, if not more. So people would, need to, would not need to do this multiple times a year like they do hair. Uh, so, in some of your cases, if you've actually done the math, uh, you will see that they're spending more on their hair than they are on their uh, smile. So, it's interesting. You know, people don't usually stop to think about that. Um, and they may be spending more on coffee than they are on one tooth whitening treatment a, uh, a year, okay? Or, I don't know, uh, trips or... Uh, collect, uh, collections of dolls or, or whatever it is. You know, people have their habits. They do spend their income on what they, they feel like spending, you know. We have, you know, Black Friday and people buy stuff that they don't need, but they still don't get their teeth treat, uh, treated. And uh, if you want just another example, think about nails. You know, how much is spent on nails each month? And again, it's mostly by women in this case, but men also, they have their perks and they have the, the things they, they spend their money on. So um, this is just to, to uh, how can I say, to, to challenge you a little bit to think about this and bring this conversation with your patient.
Okay, so you can approach in a way, if they tell you, I can't afford it, I, I, I won't go as far as saying as they're lying to you, but I will go as far as saying uh, it means that they don't, don't put the value on their smile as, as much as you should believe probably they should. Okay, so just some food for thought here for us to take into consideration. All right, uh, now let's talk about a little bit of the science, right? So this is going to be very scientific. This is going to be somewhat philosophical, and we will talk a little bit of marketing, but let's make sure we get the science down. It's very important we understand why do teeth get dark. So uh, teeth get dark, they get darker um, over, over time. You know, as we eat, as we drink, we drink tea, wine, coffee, um, we eat, uh, and, and it's normal. It's normal for uh, outside factors to be absorbed by the tooth, and then over time, you'll see that uh, molecules will accumulate, and then they'll stop blocking the light a little bit more, and teeth will look darker, okay? So th this, what I just explained to you, are extrinsic factors. Okay, so that you see here on your left side. So these are stains that come from outside. Uh, we can also have stains that are intrinsic, that they come from within the tooth. For instance, if you have a patient that grew on a, an antibiotic regime of, for instance, tetracycline, uh, you may have seen cases of tetracycline stains that you get gray or dark brown stains, bands on the, especially the cervical area of teeth. And these are very difficult to treat. I'll, I'll, I'll mention here um, how we go about those cases, but uh, this is a classic example of intrinsic staining from uh, for teeth, okay? And we can treat both these cases with traditional chemical whitening techniques with bleaching, okay? The term bleaching is actually quite correct. Um, so we have different types of stains. Now we have some more external stains like fluorosis, and I do see um, one of the, the very first question we got here was with two white spots, and I will address this uh, later on. But uh, fluorosis, for instance, is not usually treatable with uh, peroxides. We will talk about how to address those uh, it's towards the end of this presentation. Uh, endodontic treatment. Endodontically treated teeth, they tend to get darker faster. So we will talk about a specific technique called walking bleach that is one of the, of the ways that we can treat endodontically treated teeth uh, without having to whiten all, all teeth at the same time. Of course, tetracycline and, and then caries, of course, if you have a tooth that's dark because of caries, then you shouldn't whiten this. Of course, you should treat, you should remove those caries, make a restoration. So we have to understand because we cannot just go by, diagnost by the diagnostics of that tooth is dark, so let me whiten that. We have to understand why uh, is, 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 where is that dark color coming from. So how does it work? How does tooth whitening work? I, I actually didn't, don't, didn't prepare a poll question for this, but uh, think within yourselves as well. Uh, you see here, imagine that this is a tooth cut in, in half here, and you see enamel, you see dentine, and you see the pulp, okay? Now, um, where do you think tooth whitening will work? Enamel, dentine, or pulp? Okay, think for yourselves for a moment there. And I am usually, when I ask this question, the majority of people, they say enamel, okay? Uh, there is an, an effect on enamel, but really the main impact of tooth whitening is at the dentine level, okay? So uh, why? Because this is where we get those molecules. Remember that I, that, that, that I mentioned these molecules, chroma, chromophores, they start accumulating, becoming bigger. And as they become bigger, they start to block more light. Okay, so this is at the dentin level. So how do we treat this? We have a, a whitening tray, okay, that we are going to use, or we can use this in office. And then inside this tray, we will have a gel and this gel usually is carbamide peroxide, okay? And you see here the chemical composition of carbamide peroxide. You may already be seeing something in here. Do you know how this H2O2 is called, okay? So carbamide peroxide, once it's inside of the mouth, with the temperature of the mouth, it starts to uh, break down. And as it breaks down, 
one of the components of this uh, reaction is hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so uh, hydrogen peroxide is included in carbamide peroxide. And the other part of it is urea. So a car carbamide peroxide breaks down into two parts urea to one part hydrogen peroxide. So it's important for you to understand that so that you can compare apples with apples. Uh, if you have a product that is 15% uh, carbamide peroxide and you want to compare it with a product that is 5% hydrogen peroxide, different chemistries, right? But you can actually compare them. You can divide carbamide peroxide by three. So if it's 15, it's equivalent to 5% hydrogen peroxide and vice versa. Okay? You divide carbamide by three or you multiply hydrogen peroxide by three and then you, you compare one against the other. All right? Very good. But the reaction does not stop there. Uh, we, this hydrogen peroxide right here continues to break down and then we will get to, we get a few ions in there. Uh, particularly oxygen ion, which will be the main uh, responsible for uh, the whitening reaction, the bleaching reactions. So it's an oxidation reaction, okay? And you get water in there as well, and you have hydroxyl ion, which also helps whiten. But mainly the oxygen ion that you see right there, this will go inside through that those enamel prisms, okay? And it can dehydrate enamel as it goes through en enamel, so it can actually make enamel looks a little bit whiter than it should, but that's only temporary. And then once it gets to dentin, it will start breaking down those molecules, oxidizing those molecules into smaller molecules. And uh, these smaller molecules will let the light pass through. So uh, the dentin, which is not white, is a, B, C, or D shade, right, will become lighter in color, and you will be able to see that because the enamel is semi-translucent, all right? So in a nutshell, uh, this is essentially how tooth whitening works at the denting level mostly. And if you do it in the office, then you can actually just do it from uh, buccal, okay, here, and you will get the whole tooth will whiten. You will, it's not only the buccal side that will whiten, okay? So this is interesting. It's an internal residual effect. Even after you remove the whitening product and you wash, the patient washes their mouth, um, you, the, the oxygen ion will remain inside of the patient's tooth for a few days. We talk about up to a couple of weeks, okay? And this is why we don't recommend that you restore that tooth uh, before those two weeks, because if you are, have a restoration and you use your bonding agent there, there is still oxygen flourishing out coming from that tooth, and this oxygen will inhibit, uh, will create an oxygen inhibited layer between the tooth and your bonding layer, which is the most critical area that you need that resin to polymerize. Okay, so uh, do wait two weeks and do understand that there's a residual whitening effect. We only measure the result of the whitening treatment two weeks afterwards. Immediately afterwards does not tell us much because after those two weeks, it can actually go a little bit more, a little better result, or it can actually rebound. It usually does rebound a few shades uh, at, after the end of the treatment, the, also depending on the type of treatment you use, okay? For instance, if you use whitening with a light source, uh, you can have more of a rebound. And I will talk about this uh, uh, further down the road here, okay? Just bear with me. All right, now, uh, so I, I, I showed you chemically how it works. Now, can you, you can say, hey, Fabio, I, um, I, can just simply formulate or get any peroxide that it'll work, right? Because it is, uh, it, it's all peroxides, so, we, uh, we will, uh, it, it doesn't work quite like that, okay? Basically, any whitening product that you use will probably whiten. That, that is a fact, yes. But some of those products can actually, actually harm your enamel. Some products can give a lot of sensitivity. Some may not give you as good results as they should, okay? And some may, you know, reach the pulp more than it should. Remember, those ions, uh, they, if they go travel too fast through your tooth, uh, you may not be able to see that. 
uh, you, you may not get a good result because they are reaching the pulp instead of staying within the dentin. So um, here I'm going to tell you about some things that you need to look for beyond the peroxide, okay? Because a lot of dentists only think about whitening or, or even dental products as maths, okay? As mathematics. So if I have 10%, okay, I have 20%, I'll get the 20% because it's, it's faster. It doesn't work quite like that. Okay, so it's everything around the active ingredient that is really critical to, to the whitening uh, uh, result. So the first of all is the pH. So you can have an acidic pH below 7 or you can have a high pH above 7, okay, when it's uh, basic, okay, alkaline. So uh, the whitening reaction works at a slightly high alkaline pH, okay, slightly above neutral. Uh, but manufacturers, because of that, they tend to lower the pH of their products, particularly in office, more potent products, because then this product stays, has a better shelf life before it's used, okay? So, uh, but there is a drawback to this, which is if that product's too acidic, it can actually harm your enamel. It can have an etching effect on your enamel if you're talking about around 5 four, five, five something pH, uh, this can be dangerous, okay? And this can vary a lot between products. So a neutral pH helps uh, prevent caries and uh, enamel decalcification as well. Uh, this is a, the, this, these are the results from a study by uh, Professor Renato Miotalo, who is, again, one of the best uh, educators that I've ever seen on tooth whitening out of Brazil. In, currently in the United States, Professor Renato Mioto, um, he compared, he got different brands of products, commercial brands, okay, well-known from uh, multinational companies. And in green, you see here, this is what the manufacturer states is the pH. So 7, if they say it's neutral, or here, opalescence, they say it's 6.5. And then he measured all those products, and he got different levels of pH. So you see in some of these products, it was very similar to what was advertised by the manufacturer. In some cases, there was a big difference between neutral and 5.7, okay? So uh, it's important for us to have people like him to test those things because uh, the manufacturer can say, oh, it's a neutral pH. Someone with a new product can come today, and I see new products almost every week coming up and making all sorts of promises, but no published research, no studies about it, okay? So we have to really do our homework. And today it's easier than ever with um, uh, research gates and with PubMed and, and just Google, in fact, if you want to look for information on whitening, you can find uh, research. And uh, I remember back in the day, this is a few years ago, 2013, almost 10 years ago. And I remember when this came up, I was, um, uh, this is in the United States, they published this, and this is a study that they talked about bleaching changes teeth at molecular level, okay? So I remember everyone back in the day were saying, oh, tooth whitening is not safe, and we, we have to stop doing tooth whitening, we have to be more careful about it, great. So I, we actually went in to see what was this research about. And they talked about both enamel and dentine were affected. Uh, it was a product that was 35% hydrogen peroxide that induced an alteration on enamel and dentine. Okay? This is very dangerous. This is very harmful. Okay? Uh, and then if you go deeper in there, we see the actual product they're using. Okay? So this is a product manufactured in Brazil. And... Uh, this is one of those gel plus gel, liquid plus liquid that you mix yourself. I don't know if you still have those in your countries. Um, if I can give you just one word of advice all day here, and I'll give you many, and you do it whatever you want with them, okay? Um, you, you're just meeting me. I, I'll be happy to share my references, my sources, uh, the studies. But um, this type of product that you have to drop put a drop and put another drop and then you mix yourself, those are horrible. They have a high risk of, they're insta unstable. Each time you mix them, you get a different chemistry. Uh, they have low pH and to the point that this, this is a study saying that uh, this product right here caused permanent damage to enamel, okay? 
And then your patient asks you, so is whitening safe? Whitening is safe, absolutely. But if you're using products that are unsafe, and there are products that are unsafe in the market, then uh, you, you, you have to tell them. Okay, so stay away from products with low pH, and especially you, you, you can't always know, right? Because some, of, some people will lie to you. But I can say stay away from those products that you have to mix yourself. They're cheaper. Uh, the, the manufacturer of this product acknowledges that this product is bad. They have come up with other formulations, but they still sell them because they are making money out of it. Okay, so this is not a great thing that, that you know, they, they really don't care. So uh, other features that you need to look for, stability. So there's an ISO standard of quality that the stability cannot, if you say you have 10%, at no point during the life of that gel, you can have less than 7% and more than 11%, okay? It's, it's like you prescribing a medication for your patients and saying it's 150 milligrams, and then they buy that capsule, and it's, it's not 150. It says 150, but it's actually 200, or it's actually just 50, okay? So this would not be acceptable in, in, in medicine. So it should not be accepted in dentistry. Okay, so, uh, and you see here the same study by Professor Renato Miotto Paolo. Uh, you see here different brands of products, and these are only take home, so they, they are easy to manage, easier to manage. Uh, in green, what's on the label? So opalescence, 10%, 10% carbamide, 10% uh, pola, 10%. And you see here some products, they advertise 16%, but when they were measured, they only had 13%. Okay, this is not good. Uh, if you see here uh, the opposite, this product here had advertised 10%, but they actually had 11.46%. This is just as bad. This means that this manufacturer understands peroxides are unstable and difficult to manage, and they overshoot it. They make it more concentrated, so as, as time passes by, it loses efficacy, and it gets closer to 10%. This is absolutely unacceptable. This product, if there were rigorous standards for registration of these products, they would never be uh, uh, registered. They would never be licensed, okay? But they are available in your markets. So be wary of that too. Stability of the product. People think they're getting 10%. They might be getting 9, 8, or 12%, okay? All right. Additional ingredients and benefits to look for. Um, potassium nitrate is uh, a well-known desensitizing agent. So you have that in the sensodine toothpaste, for instance. So uh, this helps prevent sensitivity. There is always a risk of sensitivity when you're working with peroxides. It, whoever's telling you that it's a zero chance of sensitivity, they're lying to you, okay? But you can minimize that by having uh, the desensitizing agents, by having fluoride in your formula. Fluoride also helps minimize sensitivity at the same time that it also helps to strengthen your enamel, your patient's enamel, okay? Now, it's interesting that, of course, I mentioned that peroxides are difficult to manage. They are. So the more ingredients you put in there, the more difficult it becomes for that formula to remain stable, okay? Uh, I, I mentioned one product here that they advertise, um, that they change color over time. And that's insane to think about because if they're changing color, it means that the product is so unstable that it's breaking down the pigment of the, the very own product. So uh, they're just making it look like it's an advantage, but it's really a big disadvantage for a product. Now, uh, xylitol, uh, peroxides taste bad. So you will want to have a product that has something like xylitol, which gives a better taste to the product, but also helps prevent caries. It keeps uh, that, that flora inside of the patient's mouth at a healthy level, healthy pH, okay? And high water content as well. So the main side effect of tooth whitening is a dehydration of the tooth, and that dehydration at the dentine level will cause the movement of odontoblasts, okay, within the tubules. And that movement, the hydraulic pressure, will cause sensitivity to your patients. So you, you try to find products that have a high water percentage, and this will allow, uh, will help minimize the sensitivity as well. So see, 
there's a number of other factors just in this slide right here. And we're not even talking about concentration. Okay, some people may say, oh, you have sensitivity. It's, it's a concentration. Just go for a lower concentration. That's not necessarily the case. If you have a good product with a good system to prevent sensitivity in its formulation, you can actually go with higher concentrations and uh, have a lower risk of sensitivity than a bad product with a lower concentration. Okay? Think about that too. Um, and then finally, we will talk about sustained release. So uh, this is very interesting and no, very few people actually know about this. So uh, whitening, the current techniques, they came to us as um, an overnight treatment. So the, the first study about this from Professor Van Haywood and Professor Heyman, it, it talks about night guard vital bleaching. And this is back in 1989. And this night guard bleaching technique talks about a tray, a custom tray, and a, the patient sleeping with that tray with the gel inside of it. Now, uh, it's interesting to see that many, most manufacturers, they recommend daytime use today. Okay? Even yourselves, you may be using uh, just a few hours a day, and that's fine. But why is the reason for that? Uh, most peroxides, they actually do not release their active ingredient. They're, they don't remain active for more than two hours. Okay? This is a known aspect, a known fact. Most whitening products, I just said a couple of times, peroxides are difficult to manage, okay? difficult to tame, to control. So um, if you have a product that doesn't stay active overnight, then you win nothing by sending your patients overnight. Okay? But there, there are products that remain active overnight. So you see how many differences between brands you can find. So this uh, is a study by Professor Bruce Mattis and Professor Ubirassi Gayon okay, from the University of Indiana. And they, this, is, this is a study that has been performed many years ago. This is early 2000s. And they came to the conclusion here that with opalescence PF, the 10% concentration they used in this, uh, they found it to be active for more than 10 hours, okay? So uh, it's not at full strength, certainly, so it loses efficacy over time, but even after eight to 10 hours, it's still active, still releasing oxygen ions, still contributing to the whitening treatment, okay? So if a patient wears, uses a tray overnight, with opalescence PF, they'll have more whitening hours than if they use a brand that, like most products, they don't remain active overnight. All right? Great. So one of the main reasons that can tell you a plain sight, uh, the stability of the product is the viscosity. Okay? A very viscous product has a better chance of being a very stable product. So you have four different brands of products right here on your screen. And you see here, this is that Opal Essence PF product I just mentioned on the study on the left side. See how viscous this is. I actually did this uh, test here. This, those were my fingers they're showing here. And uh, you can see that this is sticky, viscous, uh, exactly as it's supposed to be. I don't know if you ever had a patient of yours uh, do a whitening treatment, and at the end of the night, in the morning, the next morning, they take the tray out, and they look at the tray, and there's nothing in it. I don't know if you have done this, if you've noticed this. Uh, depending on the product you use, there will be none left at the end of the application or in the morning, okay, if you do it overnight especially. What does that tell you? That, tell you, that tells you that that product is not stable, and, and just the viscosity of that product does not allow it to stay in contact with teeth for uh, enough time, okay? So uh, be careful, be careful because there are major differences between brands. They're certainly not all the same, okay? Now let's talk about take-home whitening techniques. And um, we, take-home whitening techniques is the gold standard, okay? With the custom trays. And, and thank you for sending your questions here. And I'll try to address some uh, here as, as we're speaking. And if not, uh, I'll probably will keep most of them at the end, okay? So thank you for, for sending your questions. All right. Uh, so take-home whitening is the gold standard in whitening. You, you talk about 
uh, carbamide peroxide gels usually, but also some hydrogen peroxide gels. Uh, when we're talking carbamide peroxide, usually we're talking about 10, 15, 16, 20, 22, 35 percent different concentrations. Okay, and uh, as I said, try to look for a product that's got that sticky viscous uh, formulation. Now, do um, you uh, the, the different concentrations? I mentioned this to you before. Um, a twenty percent does not whiten twice as fast as ten percent. It's not a math equation. Okay, so uh, you the different concentrations you will you can increase those concentrations. My recommendation would be to increase concentrations if you want to adap adapt to the patient's preference, lifestyle preference. Meaning that you can use the ten percent overnight, and if you want to use it just a few hours a day then you increase the concentration, but you use it for the same number of days, okay? So uh, I'll show you a video quickly here, and I'll try to keep up with it as, as it shows. Uh, the different concentrations, this is from Opal Essence, but this will work probably for other brands as well, except for the Night Guard, the 10% that you wear, right? if that product has sustained release, and the only one proven is, is this one. 15% four to six hours a day, and then 20%, two to four hours a day. If you increase it to 35%, then we're talking about half an hour to one hour a day. I will mention to you here another product called Opal Essence Go. Oh, there's 45% in some countries, and this is 15 to 30 minutes uh, a day. Now, uh, this is hydrogen peroxide, Opal Essence Go, 10%, 30 minutes to 60 minutes, and the 15% concentration, 15 minutes to 20 minutes a day. Okay. We will also talk about in-office uh, treatments, and this will be two or three times 20-minute applications, but in one session in the office. Okay? Very good. So, uh, in summary, so look for that sustained release, a high water concentration, and a sticky viscous gel, and desensitizing agents in the formulation as well. Let's review here the full warning treatment uh, application for the take-home with the customized tray. Okay, so uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this. So you make an impression of your patient. Uh, alginates fine with this. We don't need a whole lot of precision. And then once we uh, get that CAPS model, uh, we will cut that. Some of you can do this at your practice. Some of you send it out for the lab to do it. And uh, you want to cut this in the horseshoe shape. Okay, all right. So. Uh, once you have that, this is an optional step that um, is creating reservoirs for uh, your tray. So if you paint those, this is a light cured resin, okay? And see here that we're not going beyond the cervical, incisal, and proximal limits. We're always leaving at least one millimeter shy so we don't cover the whole tooth. And this is light cured, so this is very convenient. This material is called LC Blockout, light cured blockout resin. And uh, this is very convenient because it doesn't uh, go away with heat. And we need heat because we will use this vacuum forming machine that will sag off this acetate tray. And then once that cools off with the vacuum and, you, and it cools off, you can cut this. You remove the axis and then you trim, you scallop this tray around the, uh, the cervical area. You need to go one millimeter or half a millimeter into the tooth, okay? As long as you prefer, preferably don't leave that um, tray covering gingiva. If you're using 10%, it may be okay. If you're using higher concentrations, um, you may have a higher risk of getting gingival sensitivity from tooth whitening, okay? Very good. And this is just a little perfectionism. You may not do this, and that's fine. So you, you get a blowtorch, and you get a gloved finger with hot water really to prevent that. This is very important. So uh, make sure you show the first application in front of your patient. The easiest way I find it to be just one line of gel, one bead of gel, not one dot, two dots per tooth as some people say. If we do one line from one end to the other, that's very simple, very easy for the patient to understand and they, they want, they'll end up using you know a third or a fourth of a syringe per arch and, and that should be fine. Be sure not to be too stingy Okay, with, with your recommendations or else 
Uh, I have answered questions from patients saying, hey, my teeth, from dentists saying, my patient's teeth are not whitening and after three weeks. And I asked them, how, how many syringes have they used? And it was just a couple of syringes for three weeks. Obviously, those syringes, uh, th there's, there's barely any gel going each day into that tray. So uh, you have to have some gel in there. So this is a clinical case from Professor Renato Stenfeld, a different Renato from Brazil as well. And uh, here you can see uh, some of you asked about blotched uh, stains and enamel stains. Okay, this can be quite common in some parts of the world. You can see those post-orthodontic treatment as well. Uh, these here will not go away. Okay, you have to do a microabrasion treatment that we'll, we'll cover at the end. Um, but they just took the shade. This is important for you. Make sure you measure and you get the patient to agree what is the initial shade. And then after the treatments, 10% opalescence PF. Uh, you see those stains. Can you see that the stains are still there? But uh, they're not as perceptible as they used to be before the treatments because the rest of the tooth is, the, the rest of the teeth is lighter, okay? So um, it, it, the patient's satisfied. So this is truly minimally invasive, okay? So um, great result without even the need for a enamel microabrasion here. All right. Now, uh, this is a new trend, and I'm actually going to ask you here in a bit. This is a new kit designed for aligners, clear aligners. So I want you to answer me, are you using clear aligners in your practice today? Let me try to find that question from the poll. Oh, I stopped the video here. So basically, you can use that very clear aligner as your whitening tray, okay? And for that, you will need a gel that is viscous, and you use it the same way, and then your patient just they have to wear this aligner. They can wear this overnight. You use the 10% concentration. You can use other concentrations and wear for shorter periods of time. Okay, but um, let me stop sharing results. Let me ask you here: Are you using a clear orthodontic aligners? Out of curiosity, I would like to know this in your practice. So uh, the poll question: uh, This is a simpler one. Came to you. Do you work with clear orthodontic aligners in your practice? I'll give you a few more seconds to answer here. Thank you. We're getting the answers fast. And I just want to have an idea. Okay. Um, and I see here it's split almost in the middle, slightly trending towards no at the moment. But I think it's a very uh, even split here. So I'll just give five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Great. Thank you. Thank you once again for... Uh, participating. This is what you told me. So 50% of you, about 150 participants, are not currently using clear orthodontic aligners, and about just over 40% of you are. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Now, um, this is just as a curiosity. I'm not going to get very deep into this. In fact, I have another presentation tonight to a group of uh, uh, specialists here in Australia, and we will get deeper into that very subject of whitening and orthodontics. All right, now back to our treatment times. We usually, uh, we have an average, and again, this can vary from patient to patient, but uh, one to two weeks is usually eight to 12 days to 14 days. This is a, a, a good standard a benchmark in terms of number of days, regardless of the concentration that you're using, okay? And uh, that for most of your A shades. So if you have A shades, which should be, usually it's over 90% of your patients, then those are easier to whiten. Now, if you have some C, D shades, um, those are a little trickier to treat. They take a little longer and they can take twice as long. So if you look at the patient and you see it's a C3, for instance, that can take twice as long. So you prepare your strategy accordingly and you keep patient's expectations under control. I found that this is something very important. Um, I usually put this in the form of a, a mathematical equation, meaning that patient satisfaction equals the results minus their expectations. Think about that for a moment. So uh, if they, the satisfaction equals results minus expectations. If the results are not very good, they're not going to be satisfied. But even if their results are very good, 
but their expectations were very high, then they're not going to be happy either. Okay, so keep your patient's expectations under control. Tell them there's about 5% of patients that will not widen. This, this is a known fact as well. So it's not for everyone. It may not work in up to 5% of people. Okay, uh, and then of course you have uh, tetracycline cases, which are very difficult uh, to treat in the sense that they require a lot of patience. They require, require a lot of time. So um, this can take up to six months if you're just using 10%. But now today we have in-office techniques that allow us to, to do it in, in, in a shorter time. So we can do multiple in-office sessions and intercede that with take-home products, okay? Very good. And again, uh, keep the patient's expectations. Bleach until they're white. Uh, you, if you see some results and then it stops getting the result but you still would like more, it's probable that you can, if you continue trying, that you will get those results, okay? But keep, make sure the patient is compliant with their instructions. Sometimes they skip a day, skip two days, they forget. Make sure that they are following your recommendations, okay? Very good. Um, an another suggestion I have for you here, and some people cringe upon this, so one arch at a time. So this is from Professor Paulo Pagliato in Brazil. And you see here, this is a case he widened the upper arch first. And then when he finished the upper arch, he started with the lower arch. Look how incredible this is. So uh, you see in the same picture, you can see before and after. Okay? And the patient cannot argue with this. So if you have a patient that's a little difficult, that they like to have a good discussion, and you expect them to uh, not be satisfied with the white new result, do just the upper arch first. And then you continue with the lower one if that's done. Uh, if you're going to widen your staff, for instance, so they can help you talk about widening to your patients, do just the upper arch first. Let them walk around for a couple of weeks with just the upper arch and tell patients, hey, see the difference, this is tooth whitening. So people understand it's not magic. Okay, this is a dental treatment that's available to you, for you, for your patients. Okay, and then afterwards, uh, you have the final result here, upper and lower. So this was a spectacular result. But sometimes we get a spectacular results like this, but still many patients, especially in take-home techniques, they don't feel satisfied because they don't, they don't notice because it's little by little each day. Okay, so some patients tend to be more satisfied with uh, take home uh, with an in-office technique because it's a faster, it's a one session, right? Uh, they are paying more for that, usually a lot more for that. But in essence, they, they don't get better results in office, no. Okay, there, there are even studies that suggest that take home will, can give you better results. But their satisfaction level may be higher in office, even if they're paying more because they notice the difference more than they usually do at home. Now, um, let's uh, talk about here over the outer products. So I don't know if this is uh, an issue in your countries. I see, again, we have people here from uh, many different countries. We have from Nepal, Bangladesh, New Zealand, Australia, Malaysia, Vietnam. Thank you all for participating. And um, we, here in Australia, we have um, whitening products that are available on eBay, they are available on pharmacies. Uh, I receive a bunch of Instagram advertisements uh, about products from, you know, models and people saying, oh, this is dentists say that this is very good and on TV. And uh, this is what I want to tell you. This is a big risk. Uh, we have to fight those products because uh, this is just one of them, and, and this company happens to have over a million, uh, one million, thinking about, think about that, over one million followers on Instagram, okay? Can we compete against that? If they say, they can say anything. It, it, we can spend our whole entire lifetime trying to explain about tooth whitening. We're never going to reach as many people as they do with one Instagram post, true or lie, okay? So uh, you see here, there are people asking, so, oh, three consecutive treatments, and they go, yeah, you're welcome to do as many treatments as you like, okay? Uh, everyone's teeth are different. 
uh, typically takes optimal results. The remaining pods you can use whenever you desire. This is not cool. Okay, uh, this is a, a banned in Europe. You can they can go to jail for doing this. But unfortunately, again, here in Australia, the, the laws are different. So, uh, and I still see dentists, professionals supporting those products. So. It's unbelievable to me that they're doing this because the next step is for these companies just to come and take the whitening business from us. And then what do we get? What remains with us? We get those patients that are unsatisfied with those products because you gave them sensitivity or it didn't whiten enough and then they think the tooth whitening is a lie or it didn't whiten the restorations, of course, because they didn't know that. So it is, um, we have to be very careful about this. And uh, on the other hand, it's actually very good that, that there is someone with this much power investing in promoting twice because then patients become more aware of it and then it's easier for us dentists to talk to our patients about it. So there is a pro, there's a good um, consequence of this too. Okay, let's take advantage of this. And there is a product that is designed specifically for this. Okay, so this product, I don't know if you're familiar, if you had a chance to try it, um, if you haven't, make sure you ask your local Ultradent distributor to ask for a sample of Opalescence Gold. Okay, uh, this, is, this is this product, the kit right here. And uh, Opalescence Gold is uh, a number of trays, okay, that you have there. And, and these trays, they're pre-filled, right? So, um, let me just get uh, one tray here to show you. So these trays are one size fits all. So they're not as, as great as the custom trays are. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And, but they're recommended. So you don't have to make an impression for this. Uh, you don't have to, uh, it's basically ready for everyone. This is 10% hydrogen peroxide. 6% in some countries, and it can go up to 15% in some countries, okay? This varies. You have to look for the regulations in your country. But it's a high concentration that the patient will only wear for a few minutes a day, okay? And it's it's hydrogen peroxide. It has potassium nitrate. It has a desensitizing agent. It has a high water content. And this is how you use this. So uh, you tell your patient, you remove from the package, and... Uh, you center the tray on the arch, okay? And the patient, you, the first thing I would even suggest you do in front of your patient, you ask them to suck down on the tray as if they were blowing a kiss. And then they remove the outer tray and suck down again. Don't press with the fingers or else we'll get more products extruding. We don't want that, okay? And it's not a problem, okay? But that's it. Very simple. Just put it on, suck down on it, remove it, and uh, then you can just go about your day, okay? Um, so uh, I see, uh, I saw a question here talking about, is it a problem if someone, uh, if the product is ingested, okay? Uh, and it's not uh, a problem, okay? So we have more dozens of decades worth of uh, safety studies, again, on the main brands talking about how safe they are, and even the ingredients that they break down into, like hydrogen peroxide, is produced naturally by the organism. So these products are safe, but we still, of course, want to keep uh, ingestion to a minimum, not to say anything else, because we want that gel to remain in contact with teeth and not, you know, to go to the patient's stomach. Okay. All right. So uh, there are two different flavors, and you see here at the bottom, we talked about orthodontics. This is very interesting. So this is the only take-home product that you can actually use uh, while wearing orthodontic brackets, okay? Because it's a disposable tray that you wear each day. So uh, I have a kit here and, and towards the end, I can maybe make a demonstration there if we have time for it. So this, if you haven't tried this, this really feels like a custom tray. But the key to the success of this product is for you to offer this at an entry level price. So you, you think about McDonald's, Starbucks, you know, any chain, you have small, medium, and large fries or small, medium, and large coffee, right? Or popcorn, if you're going to the movie. Um, so this is for you to be able to offer three options to your patients. As a rule of marketing, this is called the rule of three. When you have three options, 
it's more likely for your patients to choose one of those options because not choosing is one option by default, right? So if you have two options only, one third of their choices is not to, the fourth option is a smaller chance for them to say no, especially if you price that at a lower price. You can price that at a lower price because Again, the cost of the product is essentially the same as a take home, but you don't have your main cost, which is your chair time. The patient doesn't have to sit there to take an impression. You don't have to have your staff. So none of that's needed. So you can actually offer this. And I've seen people offering this, depending on the country, uh, anywhere between 80 US dollars, 70 US dollars, 100, 120 US dollars. But let's say at least some 20, 30% lower would offer a custom tray take home whitening with the syringes. Okay, so uh, again, the gold standard is that take home uh, whitening. This here, the entry level, the small fry, opalescence go almost the chair time. Okay, you barely have to involve all. You know, just a dental supervision. Your a hygienist can obviously do all of these, but um, it is very it, it's it doesn't consume a lot of time at all okay so and then of course you have your large fries your large popcorn here will be your in-office treatment because um it, it costs you a lot more maybe not necessarily just the product but you have to have that one hour chair time everyone in and it's it's just more costly to do it that way okay than having the patient do it at home so you have to price that higher Okay? Don't be confused that, oh, I'm doing all my cases in office because I get more money. You, you may receive more money for the treatment, but at the end of the day, if you take out your costs, you may not be profiting as much as you could with uh, some of those other techniques. Okay, So get, make, make your calculations there and do offer three options and price this entry level, this opalescence go at a price that is not too far from what they what they, what you feel they could be buying off of pharmacies without the dentist supervision. Okay, this might be great for young patients or, or people that are you know willing to try without going to you. Now let's talk about in office widening. And when we talk about in office widening, uh, we uh, it's a different technique. We're using higher concentrations and. Um, Last time to the UK. All right. So uh, in office whitening is in this case opalescence boost is a 40% hydrogen peroxide. So it's very powerful. We also have other uh, products that are 35, 20% hydrogen peroxide. But again, remember, it's not just the concentration, it's everything that's in it. This product here is so stable that even after you mix it, it's very powerful. But if you still have some left in the syringe, you can still use this after 10 days if you keep it in the fridge. So this is a sign of how how stable that product is. So um, again, this can give you less sensitivity than lower concentration products, but there is always the risk of sensitivity. Okay, so this has over 20% water. Uh, it has a neutral pH throughout the procedure, even after mixed. It does have the potassium nitrate in the formulation and fluoride. All right, and it's chemically activated. No light needed. I'll talk about light, a few slides down here, but you will see that I personally do not recommend light at all because it doesn't add to our uh, treatment. It doesn't help. So uh, let's talk about the procedure of in office whitening. So you, the same way you are going to measure your, the patient's shade, it's always safe, a good measure to have protective eyewear because it's a very powerful, if there's some spillage, they're protected. You see here they're using this very neat cheek retractor. It's called umbrella, a lip and cheek retractor. And you see the tongue stays uh, on the back there as well. Uh, I will show this uh, here as well how this works. And this is uh, an ISO block. This usually comes in the kit. It's a bite block. You don't necessarily need to use that if you have that umbrella retractor. Okay? You are going to use your uh, resin barrier. This is called Opal Dam Green. You first check. For the fluidity of the product, you can do um, a prophylaxis on your patients and you dry the field and then you apply that resin barrier. This is a light cured resin, okay? 
then <clears throat> uh, you see here, uh, you don't want to leave any pink areas of the gingiva exposed. If you come back and see that, make sure you touch that up as this, in this case, they'll do it here. And then the great thing about Opal Dam is that you just pass your curing lights right there. You see your, the veil of light here. If you just pass it a few seconds per tooth, it fully polymerizes. Most products, you have to do 20 seconds per area, and it still doesn't work. Now, this is a critical part here of the mixing. So we have opalescence boost. You see there's a syringe inside of the syringe, and uh, it's critical that you press. And in fact, it's so critical that I will want to come back on this video right here. Uh, let me see how I can do this. Um, um, yeah, I'll actually go back on this video. Ah, there you go. So I'll try to skip to uh, that part here. Hopefully I'm not just losing more time than I would with, oh, there we go. Okay, there, I'm skipping here to the mixing. Okay, there we go. So uh, see how the syringe, they're connected one with the other, the activator with the peroxide. And this is critical right here on your left side. You have to press that plunger inside of that syringe. And this is the way that you're gonna get that red activator in contact with that transparent peroxide. Once you do that, then you will have that mixture. And then you do it for 50 times, 25 times each side, okay? Um, it's a lot of collisions, but this is very important because this is a viscous product. Some products, they come in auto mix syringes. This is not enough because you're not able to mix a thick gel like that with just eight to 12 collisions, okay, with an auto mix syringe. You see when you, you check for the flow of the product, and then you apply this on teeth. And then you leave this for 20 seconds, remove and then you can apply again for 20 seconds. You can actually leave it for 40 seconds and you get probably similar results. 20 minutes, I'm sorry, I'm glad I read this. So leave it for 20 minutes, not 20 seconds, uh, and then repeat. But you can leave it all the way to 40 minutes in one session if you want to, because the, the, the product is that stable. After you're done with the application, you remove the excess gel, okay? Very carefully, don't wash it yet because if this touches the soft tissues, it'll burn. Okay, so you want to be very careful. And once it's all removed, then you wash and suction. And uh, you can apply once again up to three times of 20 minutes in a session. And then after you're done, uh, you remove the resin barrier like that. Okay, and then you check with your patient uh, for the final results. All right, very good. So right there. Um, and then very quickly on this umbrella cheek retractor, here, we, um, where is that? Okay, there we go. So this is a cheek retractor. I don't know if you can see it very well on my screen right here. I, uh, let me stop sharing real quick so you can see me. All right, there we go. So this is that retractor that they used in this video here. So this is called the umbrella retractor. Uh, usually people ask about it, just decided to show it. So this is an alternative there. This is the, the traditional one that we see out there. This is usually, difficult to put in position and, and it pulls the, the lip out. It's not very comfortable, especially for a treatment that the patient is going to be 40 minutes, one hour sitting on the chair. Uh, this is not very comfortable. So with the umbrella retractor, uh, you just press it here. You see there's a tongue guard. So the tongue will stay, my tongue will stay behind this here. So let me show it to you. Okay. Of course, I can't talk with this, I cannot, but you can, you can see that I can even bite on it, okay? So I can take, I can use this for uh, bite registrations. Uh, so it's very convenient, uh, a very convenient product for uh, a whitening procedure particularly, okay? So let, let us go back to our presentation here. And uh, so this is, I showed you there, so a very easy, you just squeeze it in, you press it in and um, very convenient. Anyways, now this is a whitening treatment case uh, by Dr. Anna uh, Maciel from Nicaragua. And uh, this was a combined technique. So you can actually combine different techniques. This is in office with Opalescence Boost. And then she's doing Opalescence Go. The patient's continuing at home. So you can co 
finish the treatment at home. And if you've done boost, and probably you don't have the trays, the custom trays, so then you can use Opalescence Go. Uh, a couple of trays will be enough to finish up that treatment. Okay, so the combined technique is very convenient. Now, very quickly, let's talk about whitening and light sources. Um, number one, there's no significant improvement in bleaching effect. So lights do not help. This is, there's, there are over 20 years of studies, independent studies talking about this. Um, the only thing that the light may do more is dehydrates that enamel, okay? And a dehydrated enamel will look whiter. So as soon as the patient's out of the chair, they go, wow, it's really white, but that, that's not really whitening, okay? That is, um, that, that is dehydration. So if you just leave your teeth dry, you let, it, let them dry for an hour, they will be whiter, okay? But as soon as saliva kicks in, uh, as you wash your mouth, as you rehydrate those teeth, then the color will come back to the natural color of teeth. So don't fool yourselves, okay, when you're using lights. And lights can actually uh, cause uh, those oxygen ions to move faster, and they may miss the dentine and those pigments and go all the way to the pulp. So uh, you actually have a higher risk of sensitivity by using lights, okay? So the, there's a risk. It, it, the benefit is too little, and it doesn't compensate for the risk. So uh, use it. At, I'm not saying that you cannot use it. Use it as you may, but don't fool yourself, and please don't fool your patients into, into thinking that uh, the light will, will cause the whitening. As a lot of people like to say, because they want to sell gadgets, because it's cooler, because it's more interesting than just a peroxide okay, that will bleach teeth. Sensitivity prevention, so there's always the risk of sensitivity. You can have a regime of a, a potassium nitrate. This is a material called Ultra Ease. So this is a gel. It's also available in the tray uh, that's uh, the same way as Opalescence Go. So this uh, is 3% potassium nitrate, and this can help. It, it, will, it will not help with the cause of sensitivity, but it will help the patient feel better, okay? And there are some toothpaste like Sensodine, for instance, there's the opalescence whitening toothpaste. This is, not a, this is not available in all countries, but you can give your patients something with potassium nitrate before, during, and after the treatment to help if they do have sensitivity. If they have sensitivity, uh, you can, uh, I would suggest using 10% carbamide peroxide. So the lowest concentration you have available um, for a, a, an extended number of days, okay? Um, this is the protocol from Professor Paulo Vinicius Soares, also from Brazil. Can't, can't deny my roots there. I'm very proud of my Brazilian colleagues. And uh, Professor Soares published a, a book, multiple books, on non-carious cervical lesions, okay, which are very prominent these days with high stress and eating habits. And his protocol for sensitivity that you can, can use prior to tooth whitening involves uh, five minutes of potassium nitrate. Okay? that you can apply with a tray or you can apply with, as he's doing here, with a micro applicator. Okay? And then after that, uh, you wash it, okay? you dry it, and then you apply a fluoride varnish just in that cervical area. Only if you have a, a, a exposed uh, some cause of a lesion, particularly in the, the cervical area, okay? you can protect that. And it's okay because that fluoride varnish will cover that area. But remember, that's peroxide. Those oxygen ions will, walk, will work inside the tooth. Even if you have the ortho brackets on, when you, re, when you whiten, the, there won't be a mark behind the brackets. The tooth will whiten entirely. All right? Good. So uh, let's talk about our second to last technique here. We're getting closer to the end. This is something that generates a lot of interest. I think I've seen some questions in there. And this here is non Okay, so uh, I see the product work on endodontic treated tooth internal staining. Uh, whoever sent this question here is, uh, you can actually treat teeth uh, with the other products we talked about. Okay, so you can actually open the chamber the way I'll explain and use a 10% carbamide peroxide or a higher concentration. 
or even Opalescence Boost. Okay, I have used Opalescence, a previous version of Opalescence Boost internally and externally, and it worked really well. Now, this product that I'm going to show you here is specifically designed for this. All right, so uh, this technique is called the, the walking bleach. Do you see here? So this is a patient that, uh, you know, she has a beautiful smile, but of course she is traumatized uh, because that one tooth is ruining the harmony of that smile. Okay, and uh, you see here there was an endodontic treatment and that tooth all the time it gets darker faster than the other teeth. So um, you see here they're talking about a C4 shade, okay, and this is the final results that Professor Rafael Calixto, also from Brazil, uh, used here and they got a very, very uh, nice result for this patient. And the material to be used here is Opalescence Endo. This is a 35% hydrogen peroxide gel. So there's no pigment in it and it's not, it's ready to use. Those are the two main differences from Opalescence Boost. It's also a high concentration gel, but this is, um, it has a, a, a slower release than Opalescence Boost does, okay? And the way you do this, you, um, you apply this internally inside the pulp chamber. And now, the first question, I'm going to start with the end. The first question people ask me, oh, internal bleaching, there's the risk of root resorption. Okay, great. Let's address this first so we understand how to prevent this. So root resorption can happen if we have three factors. Okay, those three, fa all, all three factors, not two of them, not one, all three factors. So uh, first, the presence of inflammation. Okay, if you have an inflammation, that inflammation could be caused by that oxygen ion coming from inside the tooth to the peri periodontal area. So the, the, the gel can actually cause that. All right, number two, lower pH. Okay, so uh, if you have that inflammation, then you're probably gonna have a lower pH in there. Uh, if you have a bad uh, hygiene also, uh, of course, th this will contribute, will be a contributing factor. And number three, you will only have the risk of root resorption if you have, if you happen to have that case as one of those teeth where the uh, enamel and cementum from the tooth, they don't overlap, okay? And there is an exposed area of dentin. And that dentin that is exposed and you have a low pH and then you have an inflammation, uh, you're going to have those, your macrophages, uh, they're going to rec they're not going to recognize dentin because uh, they're going to see dentin as a sacristered an antigen. So they never see uh, dentin because of the formation, the way of the, the the way the tooth is formed. Okay, so dentin is not a known uh, substance to the macrophages. So they will react and they will attack it. So if you have those three factors, then you have the risk of root resorption. So again, you, you can have 60, 65 are patients, enamel and cementum overlap, okay? 30%, they end edge to edge. And then about five to 10% of cases, you do have a gap between them where you have exposed dentin. Only in those teeth, you have this risk, okay? Now, how do we prevent that inflammation to start with? So we can prevent that gel, that oxygen from traveling through the tooth and outside by uh, covering that area with a, a glass ionomer plug, okay? So what we want to do here is to remove all the material from inside that pulp chamber from your restoration, okay? So this is an endodontically treated tooth, one millimeter into beyond the crown line, okay? So you go one millimeter into your gutta percha, and then, uh, you will do a plug, a barrier that's represented in black here, a glass, mo resin modified glass ionomer, okay? And it's important that that barrier not only covers the bottom, okay, that floor of that chamber, but also uh, the sides as well where you have that junction between crown and root, okay? Because this is the critical area where you can have the tiny little bit of dentin exposed. So make sure that your plug follows the crown line, okay? meaning that on the proximals, it needs to be higher towards the crown, towards incisal, than 
it is here uh, at the surgical from the buccal and lingual, okay? All right, so again, just to show you here on a microscope rather than drawings what that looks like. And again, the glass uh, ionomer, resin modified, uh, they have the best barriers, okay? Or zinc, uh, zinc oxyphosphate as well. Uh, well, they failed actually. IRM, zinc oxyphosphate and sealants are not as effective as light cured glass ionomer, okay? All right, now, uh, how do we go about this? We remove, as I mentioned to you, we make that glass ionomer plug and then we apply the product inside the chamber, okay? Opalescence endo. You can actually put a little cotton bowl in there, cotton roll, cotton ball, sorry, and then you seal that off with a temporary provisional cement, okay? And you leave that on, uh, the patient, patient goes home and this is why it's called walking bleach. The patient goes out walking and they can come back in two, three days, up to five days. I wouldn't personally wait until five days because sometimes it actually whitens so fast that uh, you don't get a, a good result. So actually it, it whitens faster. So then you have to uh, address all the other teeth that are now darker, okay? So after those two, three days, uh, you, the patient comes back, you assess the color. If you're happy with the color, you remove the products, you restore with the temporary material. Remember, no permanent restoration after until after two weeks, okay? So you don't have that oxygen flourishing there. And then um, if you're not satisfied with the shade, you can reapply again, okay? And then wait a few more days and have the patient come back. So this is a, a little more complicated technique, but this is a lifesaver for patients. And I tell you as someone whose wife has a, a, a central incisor with an endodontic treatment that gets dark over time, uh, whenever that tooth is dark, she is unhappy, okay? So your patients will probably be unhappy as well if they have one dark tooth. So uh, this is a great option for a treatment that gives you a lot of control. And uh, there is the risk of absorption only if you do not understand how this works and how to prevent it, okay? So um, basically that's what it is. All right, so... Um, very good. So let's talk about our last technique today, which is something I've seen quite a few questions here, and uh, enamel microabrasion. So this is for those stains on enamel that we see here, that these, if you whiten these, the rest of the tooth will get lighter, but these stains, if they're white, they'll get super white. They'll get really, really brilliant. And, and patients, obviously, they don't like that because they become more evident. Uh, as soon as they rehydrate, they become more natural color. But uh, it is important that you understand that these are on enamel. These are not those molecules inside of dentin. So these have actually, they have to be physically removed from your enamel. And if that stain is superficial enough, then you can do what we call an enamel microabrasion. And the material for that is an enamel microabrasion slurry. This is uh, opal luster. Okay. An opal luster is a 6.6% hydrochloric acid with a silicon carbide particle, particle. So with abrasion, abrasive particles. So it preps the surface a little bit with the acid and then those particles will help remove. And this is just very superficial. We're talking about here 0 0.2 millimeters deep. Okay, and this is imperceptible to the eye. Now, uh, if we go deeper than that, this treatment will not work. If that stain is deeper within enamel, you may need to do a micro restoration. You may need to do a veneer if it's a very severe case. But uh, I think it's worth a try with the enamel microabrasion because that is a less invasive technique than the others I just mentioned to you. Now, there's a trick that you can identify how deep that stain is. It almost always works. Uh, if you have that stain, can you see here this white spot on enamel? If you transilluminate that, and you can use your curing light, uh, some lights, like the Velo curing lights, ha have 
uh, translumination tips. So these are tips that make it safe for to look at them. Okay, this green tip is safe for you to look at, and uh, as opposed to the blue light, so that you should not look directly at it because it, it will harm your eyes. But this stain right here, you see that the stain is blocking the light. Uh, so this means this is probably deeper and it probably will not work. Uh, Opaluster will not work. But if this stain shines, lets the light go through, then uh, there's a good chance that uh, the enamel microabrasion treatment will work. And let me show you right here how this works. So this is a patient. You see the stain? Those stains are spread all over the enamel, but they are superficial. So we get the opaluster slurry here and we test. So you see this is a cream, it's a paste, very consistent. You apply this in position, okay? And then the kit already comes with a cup, a special cup that has a brush in it. And you do this uh, at slow speed for 40 seconds per tooth, okay? And then if the stain, the stain should be gone by now, but if the stain still persists, you can reapply this a second and up to uh, three times, and then you do this again, and then th those stains should be gone. If they're not gone after that, then you should try a more invasive procedure, okay? And then you can finalize this with a fluoride varnish or a fluoride treatment, and you see here this is before, and this is immediately after. So the patient actually sits on the chair and they stand up without those stains. So this is very common for, you have, you have teenagers, uh, some areas, depending on the country, you have endemic fluorosis, so there's a high percentage of patients with those stains. The very first question we got here today was about uh, how can we get rid of white spots after ortho treatment, okay? So uh, this is it. So orthodontics, uh, usually ortho patients, they are not able to uh, clean their teeth as, 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 as properly. So when they remove the bracts, they have some hypocalcification, some stains. You can actually treat those with opaluster here, okay? So this is very convenient for that too. Very good, and at the finish line here, we're gonna talk about strategy, and I mentioned to you how many dentists we have in Brazil when I graduated, over you know 20,000 every year, competing, lowering prices, trying to compete against the dentist on the next street, when really those are not our competitors. Remember, we're talking about standing out in competing against our priority, our patients' priorities. So uh, from the marketing perspective, I would suggest, I would give you a few tips on how you can use whitening to bring more patients in. This is very quick, okay? Uh, you can offer free whitening treatments to brides, to grooms, you know, weddings, um, usually, especially when, when COVID passes, hopefully soon, and we are able to have large ceremonies again we always have, you know, the bride is an influencer at that moment, and the bridesmaids and the the the, the best mates, you know, they uh, they are in evidence. They're going to be in every, all pictures. So if you you can make a package for the bridesmaids, for the groomsmaids, and um, this can help bring those people in. They, you know, maybe they don't have a dentist. Maybe they're happy with the way you treat them and then they come back to you after that. So this is just one idea. Whiten your staff, uh, have them talk about the treatment, have them share, hey, I had a little bit of sensitivity, or no, oh, but it worked, okay? Uh, special occasions, so think about Father's Day, Mother's Day, um, Christmas, oh, you name it, you know, New Year, Chinese New Year. Uh, celebrate, invite someone, invite the patient's mother on Mother's Day, okay? Offer free treatment. I'm sure the patient will feel very happy to be able to offer a treatment to, to her or his mother or father, okay? And whitening is not only for young people, okay? So get older patients as well to feel more excited. Whitening is a great treatment to get people excited about their smiles. And social influencers, you know, either digitally, digitally on Instagram, on Facebook, I'm sure you, you, some of your patients might have an influence, but also socially. You know, maybe they are the, 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 the football captain in their club, in, in their school, or they, they present, they, they are in evidence. So if you identify someone that you see that someone could, that could influence someone, that if you can change that person's smile and they will tell you, oh, I, I did this with Dr. John, okay, uh, then they 
um, you might get more people coming in at a low cost. And this is the beauty of whitening. It costs you very little. It can offer a with Opalescence Go, for instance, your cost is very little. You don't even need to take their impression. Okay. And also, you know, come up, the list goes on, uh, gyms or, you know, think about your ideas. And, and the very last thing I'm going to share here, this is a white for life program. So offer this to your patients. This is done in North America. This one program I show, I'm showing here, this is from Canada. And it's very interesting. When they sell, when a, a practice sells a tooth whitening treatments to the patient, they sign an agreement with the patient where the patient has free whitening maintenance, free whitening touch-ups for their lifetimes or for 10 years, okay? Um, as long as they come back every six months for their preventative consultations. So they come every six months, they pay, they get their teeth, they get their checkup, they get maybe a sealant or whatever treatment that you do every six months on a preventative basis. And then at the end of that, you give them a couple of trays of Opalescence Go. And just with those two trays, two, three trays, they uh, are good to go to touch up their whitening. Okay. So um, once they've whitened once, the second, third, fourth time, it, it's faster. It goes better. And it's better that they keep doing this through you. So this is something that has very low cost to the practice, a very high value to the patient. In fact, I have seen this. I just uh, took a screenshot from my phone. Uh, this is a practice here in Sydney that is doing this. Have you booked your six-month checkup? Get your free widening when you stay on time. So have an agreement. If they miss their appointment once, they lose this benefit. Okay? So uh, it might be good to have a contract for that. Very good. It was a lot. We covered a lot here. We are just over the, the promised one hour and a half mark. Uh, let's go over some questions. Uh, just before we get into the questions, and we have about 37 of them here, I um, would like to invite you to uh, check this website out. It's educationmadeaccessible.teachable.com. Or you can, if you're not on your, using your phones already, you can use your phones for this QR code. And this here um, is a website of continuing free continuing education. So you will find a number of free webinars, pre-recorded webinars, uh, that you get a certificate at the end upon completion as well. And uh, this is uh, di different subjects. So we have laser dentistry, light curing, tooth whitening. Uh, restorative dentistry, layering techniques, you name it. There's a number of uh, topics in there from international presenters from all over the world. And we high-end, well-known presenters, ed excellent educators, and these are all free. And every month there are new courses being added there. So make sure you check this out as well. So with that being said, and as we go to the questions, I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, we, we had a large group of you here. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, and please do send your questions. And Hanif, if you're in there, it might be a good time to join in here. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fabio, for the presentation. So uh, we will go ahead and answer your questions. Yeah, as mentioned, we have uh, almost 40 questions and some uh, Oh, Dr. Fabio already mentioned during the uh, during his presentation. So first question we're going to uh, okay we're going to go for the first question. This is from uh, Dr. Maxuda. What is the age limit for the teeth whitening? Excellent. So uh, thank you, Dr. Maxuda, for your question. So the age limit there there isn't well age limit up there isn't. So older patients can whiten their teeth. Younger patients, yes, there is usually a limit. Um, Professor Van Haywood, who is one of the authorities on the subject, he usually talks about uh, as soon as you have that root, those roots formed, fully formed, uh, you can start whitening. So we're talking about 12, 13 years of age. Um, and, and again, of course, we want to be careful not to overdo it or get teenagers to start too early or think that they need whitening. Uh, only do it on younger patients if they really, um, you know, if, if there could be some psychological impacts like bullying at school for having darker teeth. Uh, and if it's, a, if it's very dark, if it's a serious case, 
You can even consider on younger patients than deaths. Again, there, there's no known uh, documented issues with doing whitening on younger patients. But again, we want to avoid unless if it's a very serious case that can cause more trouble than we would cause potentially with the whitening treatment. Okay, next question. This is from Dr. Sanam. Uh, can O2 ions penetrate through animal interprismatic species to effect action from dentin? Okay, so uh, the, um, the oxygen ions is actually not O2 ions, it's O minus ions, right? So those ions will actually, they will penetrate through the interprismatic spaces on enamel and do that at the end. So this is exactly what I had explained at the beginning there. Yes, good, good point there. So from Anonymous, the most common problem with teeth whitening is sensitivity. I think you have addressed this as well, but how do you manage it for the patient who has very extreme sensitivity? Okay, I believe this question came early on. I, I, I hope that I've been able to address that uh, during the, the, sensit the sensitization protocol that I mentioned, the potassium nitrate and the fluoride. So uh, if, if that does not address your question, please make sure to, to let us know here. So the next question, this is from Dr. Se Matt Shahiria. And how could one ask the patient to wait for two weeks to see the, the, the effects? Because every patient wants to see the, the, the wife the, after getting the procedure. This is for the patient who are you know, very eager to see the results. Very, very good question, Dr. Sheikh. Um, so we, well, we don't have to ask them. They will see the results immediately, yes. Mm -hmm. But we have to tell them as soon as they're done immediately with the treatment, we can tell them you can actually get a little lighter or you can get a little darker afterwards. And this is normal. So they don't um, find that they're not surprised by it. We don't want surprises. We want to guide our patients through the treatment, okay? So uh, assurance is a little difficult to give. But again, there is that variation, that fluctuation. And almost always there is a little rebound. So the shade will come back a little bit uh, after during those two weeks. Okay, this is a known fact. Okay, uh, next question. What is the interval for teeth whitening procedure? So up to how many months or how many days you can can do the dentist can, can do the procedure again? Okay, I think we just talked about this again. Um, you can Whitening is safe, we know that. I think it's mostly avoiding a, 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 a culture of being addicted to whitening. We don't want anyone addicted to whitening. So uh, we can wait, it depends. Most cases we can wait one, one year, two years in between sessions. But again, even this idea of doing a quick touch up every six months is perfectly uh, healthy for, for the patient. And we're not doing a full treatment the second, third time around, we're just doing a touch up. Okay, thank you for that answer. Next question from Dr. Tabism. You know, in Asian country, we use turmeric in our food. So that's why I want to know how, he wants to know how long whitening will stay after the treatment and how many times we can do treatment in the patient. Okay, um, so it, it's similar, the answer is similar. So uh, again, there's not a limit as, as to how many times we can treat a patient. We can do it throughout their lives. Uh, let's just make sure that we don't overdo it. Okay. And again, some countries, yeah, turmeric or some others, depending on the cultures, there, there are some foods that stay more. But regardless, um, is whenever you feel you can do it, I would say it's six months is good. But if you need to do it before six months, touch up, uh, you, you can do it, but again, be careful not to make the patient feel that they need to do it every month. So next question we have from Dr. Chang Nam Sim. Is a reservoir really a must? So what happens if no reservoir in the tree? Is there any difference? Okay, uh, this is a very interesting question and uh, there's a, 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 it depends answer, okay? So a reservoir uh, is, is not necessarily a must, okay? Um, so there are studies that talk about you getting a better retention of the tray with this reservoir, and some even talking about slightly better results. But there are studies on the other hand as well, comparing with and without reservoirs, 
and they came to the same results. So science published studies, they are split at this moment. So there are opinions that talk about them being helpful and some people that's just talking about them not, not helping much at all. So. Okay, so next question we have from Dr. Budianto. So which is more effective, it, use the in, in office for one hour or, or, or 10 to 15 days use at home? So the comparison between these two. Yes, uh, Dr. Li Wang, it's, dif it's difficult to compare. So to so use it at home, 10, 15 days compared to one hour office use. Uh, I would say probably there, there's a better chance that you get a better result if you use 10, 15 at home than one hour in the office, okay? Um, but if you do in one hour in the office and you touch up with a couple of sessions at home, then you may get to a very similar result. So, uh, but or, you know, it may it just from that one hour, depending on the case, it might be all you need and you get the full result. But in most, in some cases, given these two that you showed here, I would probably say that in some cases you can get a better result from 10, 15 days at home. Okay, uh, so next question. As uh, this is maybe Dr. Fabio can give us a tip about tooth selection, you know, before we offer to, to our patient with selection. You know, yes, to so um, again, tooth selection before offering tooth whitening. Well, I, I didn't quite get this question. Can you give some tips for tooth selection? Uh, again, if it's all the, the whole smile, then, then you go for it. I, I don't think I understand this. If you can rephrase that, uh, I'd appreciate uh, for the person who asked this. It's, it's anonymous. Okay, next question. We, we uh, talked about this one here, so let me skip that one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about opalescence boost. We went through the whole procedure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Sartika, of the talk, uh, I, talked about, I remember reading this during the presentation, if the patient accidentally swallowed, uh, so it's not a problem. I mentioned this during the presentation. There are many studies approving that. So thanks for that question. I actually did answer this during the, the presentation there. What, what else, Hannah, if you got there? Uh, some of you, some of the questions you already addressed during the presentation. Let me see. Uh, Okay, this is from Anonymous as well. So if patient has class V, anterior filling and composite diastema closure and wants to do in office whitening, what should be the, the steps? Do I, do, do I need to remove anterior composite first before bleaching or bleaching can be done while composite stay, please? Very good question. So if they have a class five restoration, um, it's uh, the, the resin, the restoration will not change color. So you can whiten and depending on the translucency of your restoration, uh, it can stay there and it could be fine or uh, it could actually be different. So you may need to change that restoration afterwards. I would not remove the restoration before whitening. Okay, so do the, do the whitening treatment, wait those two weeks, see if that color, if that resin now is darker, then, uh, then you may want to replace that. But mm -hmm. uh, wait until you do the whitening treatment first and you may be surprised that it will look the same. It will, it will look nice. Okay, so next question. This is quite interesting from Karen T, Dr. Karen T. So what is your opinion on charcoal toothpaste? So you can mm. see like, a lot of like out there. Okay, um, so, Yes, I, I, I think it's a marketing gimmick, okay? Charcoal toothpaste will not whiten teeth. This is pure marketing, and uh, this, is only, uh, this only has superficial effect, just like any toothpaste can have a superficial whitening effect. Um, a, a whitening, quote-unquote, in this case, because it's not a chemical reaction. So uh, this is the same way that people sell toothpaste, tooth, toothbrushes, saying that the toothbrush will whiten teeth. If you have clean teeth, it's more likely that you have whiter teeth. Uh, charcoal toothpaste is, again, it's, it's more of a marketing gimmick, really. Uh, there's no scientific evidence that it will bleach. It doesn't bleach, of course. Uh, it can only impact on, on enamel, but it's just removing superficial stains, just like most toothpaste today they can do without charcoal. 
Next question, this is from Dr. Inda Yuri. After, this is a suggestion you, you mentioned this now. After uh, the upper arch is done, uh, what do we use to maintain upper arch result while waiting for the lower treatment? Uh, where is that one? Uh, Dr. Inda Yuri. Oh, okay. After upper arch, what do you use? Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, uh, you don't need to maintain. So if you do the upper arch first, you really don't need to. Um, you don't need to to do anything. You're done with it, and then um, you, you're just doing the lower. So you you really after you're done with the upper, there's no need to maintain. Uh, it, it could rebound, but again, that's natural. And even after the rebound, it will be lighter than it was before the treatment. So no need to do anything there. Thank you for the question. So next question from Dr. Let me see here. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta, you want to answer this question? So this is the, she wants to do the bleaching, uh, teeth whitening on, on, her, on her teeth, but, but uh, she has an implant followed by a crown on upper right lateral in Kaiser. So how, how, how we can do that? Yeah, if you have an implant with a crown, of course, uh, that will not whiten. So uh, you have to consider if, once your smile is lighter, if that tooth will be darker. And if that's the case, uh, it may not be a good case for you to be a whitening patient. So uh, you may want to remove, replace that crown, depending if it can be used an update. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one, right? We have always to consider those uh, restorations, existing restorations. Okay, next questions we have from, uh, I don't know whether you, you want to address this, but, but, but this is from Anonymous. Since there are many teeth whitening products out there, uh, you know, that offering cheaper price online. So how do we convince our, our patient to, to do you know, our in-office in, in treatment? Yeah, very good point. I think I've addressed this as well. Mm -hmm. So there are many whitening products out there and we have to tell them, there's no science behind those. Uh, anyone can make a, a, a peroxide gel, but those products, sometimes they can be harmful to enamel. Uh, if you run into any problems uh, while using them, you will call them, they won't be able to help you. Mm -hmm. So it's the dentist supervision really that is, is a part of the, what they're paying for. It's not just the treatment, the, the, the product. It, it's you, the specialist, right? It's like that joke with the mechanic that charges $200 to just give one hammer on the wheel. And they say, but you just gave one hammer on the wheel. And then they go, okay, it's $1 for the hammering and then it's $199 for knowing where to hammer. Thank you. So next question, um, let me see. So this is from Anonymous as well. What is your opinion on etching prior to the office whitening? Yes, the office treatment? that's a great question. What is my opinion on etching prior to office whitening? absolutely against it. Don't do it, okay? There's absolutely no need to etch. And in fact, we're avoiding, we're doing everything to avoid any etching on our enamel. And in the United States, with which there's a technique that came from the United States that is usually a more aggressive country in terms of approach in dentistry. Not everyone, of course, but there's this one guy there that launched this total etch whitening or full deep whitening and that's really BS. Uh, don't do it. It's not necessary. Uh, you don't get a bad result if you etch. And why? Why would you etch a perfectly healthy enamel? Mm -hmm. Okay, next question we have from Dr. Saida Mokta. So this is maybe your advice on our patient, how to maintain the result, how to maintain the, the color after, after they do the treatment, the whitening treatment. Uh, so once they do the treatment, they can actually use some whitening toothpaste. In this case, you know, the whitening toothpaste is not really whitening. In this case, it's whitening, quote unquote. But uh, they can use a whitening toothpaste just with the abrasive, uh, with fluoride, and they can actually maintain that, their, their whitening treatment, their, their, their whitening results. Uh, every now and then, they may need to touch it up uh, with a couple of uh, trays, a couple of nights, or a couple of days of treatment. But... Uh, but yeah, it's it's very simple to to keep teeth white after you do it. Okay. Hey, I saw a question here that I found interesting. Um, 
we use to keep patients in water. Okay, if we keep patients, we use bleach until it's white. How do we charge the treatment? From Dr. Li Wang again. Um, it's you have to plan. So meaning that if you if you don't get results and you have to go longer and longer and longer, uh, you may need to tell your patients that we have to go long. This will cost you more, or you calculate that in the cost at the beginning of your treatment. And again, the biggest cost for your treatment will not be your product. It will be your time. So uh, try to calculate as if they would uh, need a little bit more product than uh, you than you expect. Uh, and and I, I, this is the one I found it from uh, Dr. Manjit Kumar Jha. Yeah. Uh, tooth whitening can decrease the rate of caries. Very interesting point. Uh, if you can hit done on that, uh, Hanif, as well. So uh, the, mo mostly that's not the case, but there are products that actually, your whitening product can actually reduce the risk of caries. So not only it doesn't harm, but it can actually reduce the risk of caries. So uh, opalescence PF 20%, there's a study about it, 10%, that that PF formula with the fluoride, actually teeth after whitening, they were stronger, than teeth on the control group that uh, didn't go through any whitening at all. Okay, so uh, we can jump to the next question. So, uh, okay, I'm removing some of the questions here that I mm -hmm. see that I have already answered. Yep. Okay, no etching required prior to opalescence endo or ever. Again, uh, Dr. Amala. Okay, I see a good one here on uh, method. Okay, so will tooth whitening, uh, Dr. Dean, me, uh, will tooth be restained after walking leech? If yes, should we uh, crown the tooth after walking leech? So we are only whitening because we're hoping that it, it will keep it under control. But it, yes, you can actually darker faster than others. So, but you can. Try to treat that, try to touch up just with some external whitening, and you can do this in office in one session. But if, if that becomes a problem that's constantly getting darker, you may want to crown. Uh, it's, it's a little too aggressive, but you know, if that's what will bring peace to that patient, a veneer or a crown might be the solution, yes. But hopefully, uh, with this technique, we're hoping that it will not be such a constant problem that the next time it gets darker, it's hopefully in sync with the rest of the smile. And if not, we can actually treat that one tooth separately every couple of years or so. so. Okay, um, here's a good one. Dr. Kim Huyn, how to whiten teeth in case of yellow teeth due to long term of chlorhexidine? Yes, uh, chlorhexidine can, can stain teeth. Uh, you have to be persistent. You have, just like also with uh, tetracycline, this is a difficult case to treat, but if you're persistent and if you're patient, uh, you can actually treat that. Okay, next question. This is a good question, I guess. Uh, it's from Lee Hong, Dr. Lee Hong. If whitening, I think this is talking about the boost, whitening touch the gum and burn it, so how we can, what we can do. Good question, Dr. Lei. So uh, if whitening touches the, the gum and burn it, then uh, we can actually we can actually just wait. I usually I used to just put a, 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 a cotton with water on top of it just to relieve. Okay. Uh, you have some products that you can apply. Uh, there are some even commercial products. I, I can't remember the name of them, but uh, um, I don't want to say something wrong here, but uh, I would have to look and get back to you on, on what the product, but again, I usually actually didn't use anything. I just put some water to relieve the patient just to make them feel a little better, uh, and then that would be enough, and then that disappears after a few minutes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is it okay, okay, Dr. Bosman, is it okay to let a uh, patient take home whitening even after in office? So we, we did talk about this. It's perfectly fine to combine any of the techniques we talked about here. Okay. Okay. Ah, a good one. There we go. 
Dr. Nahid Parvin, advice to the patients what to do and not to do uh, after whitening treatment. So, um, interestingly enough, we used to say uh, don't uh, eat pigmented foods, okay? Uh, so, avoid red wine, avoid smoking, but really, um, there are studies now talking about uh, you don't need to recommend a white diet for patients after whitening. I, this is counterintuitive. I, I found it unusual when I read about this, but now I feel confident that um, really that uh, you don't need, there's enough research telling us that once you've done the whitening, they can come back to drinking their tea, they can come back to, back to their usual habits. Of course, if they do too much uh, of too many pigments, uh, try, let them know that over time this will darken, but um, it's, it's not a problem these days. You don't need to recommend a white diet. Okay? This is something that has changed my, my opinion because there's more research uh, available to us now. Okay, uh, let me continue here, Hanif, uh, in, in yeah. just in case if you can check the chat if there's anything happening there. <clears throat> we have uh, five more questions here. So um, sometimes patients ask, how long will whitening last? And in, so, yeah, and again, as I mentioned, six months to two years uh, is a good average. It can be a little lot less than that if you have uh, masala or some other uh, pigmented foods there. Um, for teeth, when you have gingival recession, can we widen the exposed root dentin? <clears throat> uh, will that increase sensitivity? That will probably increase sensitivity. Uh, I would not recommend whitening exposed root. Uh, probably you may want to cover that with a little flowable resin uh, in a more aesthetic shade if that's really looking bad. Um, if, depending on the case, you may even want to cover that with a pink color uh, composite, flowable composite, like a permaflow pink, that it can look a little bit more like gingiva, and then you leave that crown to shine. You just whiten that crown, and that's, if you paint that, if you restore that, cover that with that pink resin, then you have that barrier that will protect that root as well. So I wouldn't suggest, I wouldn't recommend uh, whitening exposed roots. Um, is opalescence ideal, Dr. Stephanie Lane Callas? Is opalescence ideal for patients with pending treatments or have existing cavities? I would recommend, and that's a very good question as well, uh, if they are going through a treatment and if they have existing cavities, I would recommend treating those first. Even a serious periodontal treatment, uh, you know, uh, make sure you address, address the key stuff first, you know, the get them into a healthy environment. Once that mouth is healthy, then you widen. Uh, only if there's a major restoration in there, let's say on a front tooth, uh, and of course the color will change, you will not be able to restore it, you may want to do like a, a provisional restoration on that tooth until you get the final color, or um, you may even, once you're done with everything, just wait for that tooth, whiten, and then you, you do your final restoration once you have that final shade set. Okay, that's a, that's a very good strategic question here. Um, okay. We have one from the chat box here. So Dr. Epa Mahmoud, he wants to, maybe you want to address again, like what are the side effects for whitening treatment? Side effects for whitening treatment? Mostly, again, it's a very conservative treatment. If you use good products, you're not going to have any side effects on enamel, nothing permanent, just temporary that restores to itself. Uh, but you do have a sensitivity, and most of that is caused from dehydration of teeth. But really, um, and again, if someone really overdoes it, uh, it's never been documented. And chemically, you can actually uh, destructure uh, degrade enamel if you overdo it, but that's impossible to do it clinically. But again, psychologically, you want to avoid people that feel they need white and to feel confident, okay? So manage that. I think there's a psychological impact is, is important to, to understand there too. So we have two... I have a couple more here. So uh, when mm -hmm. to use sodium fluoride for sensitivity, I, I did address this here, but this is a question I get all the time. Will it stop the whitening process if you use fluoride, okay? 
And this is very interesting because I've seen studies talking about it doesn't impact the time of treatment. So if you uh, have sensitivity and you do a fluoride application and then you continue the next day with whitening, studies talk about that's not delaying the treatment. But I have some clinical colleagues that mention that they notice that it delays a little bit. So again, I'm a little on the fence on that, but uh, science Scientifically speaking, it shouldn't delay the treatments. And then I have here, my patients uses 35% at home, more than six hours during sleeping. Uh, okay, so uh, Dr. Nguyen, uh, this is, I'm glad you asked this. It, it's not the ideal recommendation. Uh, sleeping six or six hours with such a high concentration, um, if they're not having sensitivity, that should be okay. Okay, but there, you, you're, you're increasing the risk of sensitivity for this patient. So if you follow that protocol where 35% would be 15 minutes per day uh, or, or actually half an hour per day uh, to one hour, you, 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 you're, you're better off. But again, if your patient doesn't have sensitivity, you can actually create your own custom protocol based on your own clinical experience. But I wouldn't necessarily suggest, but if you don't see any issues, if the patient's going and, and handling, handling it well, um, it, it's okay. But uh, some people feel they need to have higher concentrations. My very favorite concentration is 10% carbamide peroxide, okay, uh, overnight. If you can do it overnight, absolutely use that. So um, it's natural for us to say, well, it's the same price, 10 and 20, I might buy 20. You don't need that. As I said, 20 is not twice as effective. 10% is great because you can do it overnight and you have the, less, the least risk of sensitivity of all of them. Okay, um, Dr. Anas, what is your opinion about whitening with light laser, biolase? Okay, all right. Good, good point. So again, we don't recommend light, any type of light, or including laser. Um, some, some laser manufacturers, they talk about benefits. If, if that laser, that light you're using is helping desensitize, which is another benefit of lasers, great. That, that's a great benefit. Uh, but the, the light itself, people oversell it, okay? So uh, what will whiten teeth is not the light, is not the laser, is the chemical reaction from the bleaching from the peroxide, okay? So um, if you can use the laser, again, especially if you're using with a wavelength that will help control sensitivity, but don't believe the laser manufacturers want you to believe that the laser is doing the whitening because they want to sell their lasers, right? But they're not. It's the whitening gel that is actually doing the whitening. Excellent question. Thank you. And the last question today, yeah, if we don't have any more there. Personal. Yeah, I think that's all. So last question is a bit personal for you. I think you need to answer that you have. Yeah. So this, yeah. Dr. Fabi, you have a beautiful set of teeth. Have you experienced teeth whitening yourself? Uh, yeah, this person wants to know about... Well, uh, anonymous attendee, thank you very much. Nice. Very kind of you. Um, I, my teeth are, are, they were very easy. I have whitened, yes. And the first time I whitened, I was, I believe, 20 years, 21. And uh, so I, but, but when I went to get my teeth whitened, my dentist actually noticed that I had some resin from my orthodontic brackets in it. So this is why they looked a little darker. Uh, they were imperceptible, but they were making my teeth look darker. Um, and when I did it, I was supposed to go two weeks, but after the third night, it was already enough for me. So I'm one of those patients that whiten really fast. Some uh, of your patients may be like this, or they may um, be uh, take longer than two weeks. Okay, so it, 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 each patient is a different case. Um, but, but yeah, every, if I get here, if I put this in my, in my mouth, just one day, it will really get my teeth really white, um, to the point that I, you know, I'm fine. I don't want it. So, um, and again, this is why you can actually whiten too much to the point that it's no longer, that's out of harmony. So you have to find that balance. Lucky you, Dr. Fabius. So I think it looks like we have covered all your questions. Uh, thank you again for the presentation so uh before we wrap up if you want to learn more about our products you can visit our blog at 
en.autradent.blog. We have published interesting articles every week. And also, as mentioned by Dr. Fabio, we have online free online webinar platform where you can register and access at educationmadeaccessible.teachable.com. I've shared in the chat box so the address you can click straight away. And then uh, you can follow us as well on Instagram and Facebook. So other than that, for information as well, we will send your certificates in the next few days. And uh, so that's all, I guess, from us. Thank you again for joining us and stay safe. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.